Hi, this is lesson 5.6, solving differential equations, exponential growth and decay. This is one of my favorite pieces of calculus, but we have differential equations are equations where I give you the derivative. In this course, you will only learn how to solve the simplest types of differential equations, which are called separation, uh, separation of variables. You may be asked to find a general solution and then a particular solution. This is where you find the C value. This give you, you add the C to the general solution that will give you all of them. So our procedure, write y prime as dy dx. You have to use the Leibniz notation for this. And then multiply both sides of the equation by dx, get the differential. Then separate the variable. That means that if I have dx on one side, everything has to be in terms of a constant or x. If I have dy on the other side, then everything there has to be in terms of y. Integrate both sides of the equation, add c to one side, solve for y, and then use the initial condition to solve for c if initial condition is given. All right, here we go. Example number one. Find the general solution of x plus 2yy prime is equal to 0. So we said, okay, I want to change the y prime to dy dx. Now we're going to do what we call a separation of variables. So I need to get the x's and the y's on individual sides. So 2y dy dx is equal to negative x. Now I can take this dx and put it over here. Now it looks like I'd have everything in y, everything in x. One thing I would suggest though is try to keep this y as clean as possible. However, in this case it works out okay. Now I can integrate both sides and I'm going to get y squared is equal to negative x squared over 2 plus c. So I separated the variables right here and then I took the antiderivatives of both sides and then I put plus c. Now my last step is to solve for y probably. And so y is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative x squared over 2 plus c. I do need this plus and minus right there. What will happen then is if I have to find the uh, particular solution, in other words, find the c, wherever my y value is, so for instance, if I had to plug in a point zero, negative one, I don't even know if this is on the curve or not, but look at your y coordinate, it's a negative one. That means that you have to select one of these and that would be the negative one because otherwise y cannot be negative. So look at the values that you plug in and that will help tell you which one of these you're gonna be using. So then that puts me with both of these equations, those are both possible equations for what we have. Example number two, find the equation of a function which contains this point, uh oh, that looks like an initial condition, whose slope is this for each point x, y on the curve. So they're already telling me that dy dx is equal to x e to the x squared all over y. So we want to separate the variables, get the x's on one side and the y's on the other. And usually with separation of variables, it's just a multiplication process that you have to do. So here, if I put the dx here, I'm good. And here, if I put the y over here, I'm good. So that's just multiplication or what you might call division, I don't know. So those are my two pieces. So I'm going to have the antiderivative of y dy. That's everything exclusively in y. And then here, everything ex exclusively in x dx. Nice. So then this one here again is y squared over 2. This one I would need a u substitution, but I know that I need a u is equal to x squared, du is equal to 2x dx, so I need a 2, so I need a 1 half. So this is 1 half e to the u, so that would be e to the x squared, and then plus c. That's one form of my equation. Now they do tell you that I want to know that this is the point on the curve. So that should lock in my C. So now I can plug in this value, this uh, Y value up here, or these, these values, and find my C value. 
Now I could get rid of this two and call this a new C value. Students sometimes mess that up and you gotta realize that it does change the C value for what you have. So I'm just gonna do it as I have it. So I'm gonna plug in the three for Y and then one half and then E to the zero plus C. This is just a one, so I'm gonna subtract one half there, so I'm gonna get four, so C is equal to four. Now if I multiplied everything through by two, I'd get C is equal to eight, so it depends how you look at this. But now this is my particular solution, one half E to the X squared plus four. Now at this point, I could multiply by two, e to the x squared plus eight, and then take the square root, and it's gonna be plus or minus. Now, here's a word of caution, though. Look at this right here again. What did my y value come out being? Well, it came out to be a negative three. I better get, get a negative three for this. So instead of doing plus or minus, I'm just gonna use the negative solution because I know my y is going to be negative here. So this is what we end up with. So that is my particular solution. Solve for y. You'll see this in AP lingo. They will say, find the particular solution that looks like this, y equals f of x. Well, that means solve for y. So that's when you have to solve for y. This, that's what that's telling you. So that's what I did here. And it should work out that if I plug in zero that I am gonna get a negative three. Okay, let's look at example number three A. Find the general solution of this one right here. Well, things aren't nice order here, are they? So y minus two, if I bring the dx over, is equal to x dy. Wow, that isn't what I want at all. So I'm gonna to have to divide both sides by y minus two and by x. And so if I rewrite this, this is gonna be one over x dx and then one over y minus two dy. I needed to separate my variables. I need to get x's on one side and y's on the other. So now I can integrate. So this would be ln absolute value of x plus c is equal to ln y minus two. I only need the plus c on one side because if I put them on both sides, I just compile it all into one on one side anyways. Now how do I deal with this? Well, to undo the natural log, I e both sides. And when I do this, this right hand side is going to be y minus two. And my left hand side is going to be this is gonna be a little weird for us, and I might have to do a little talk off to the side here. I think you'd all agree that if I have x to the a times x to the b, you get x to the a plus b. Bases are the same, add exponents. But if I give you this, x to the a plus b, what's that equal to? Well, that's x to the a times x to the b, so I can multiply those two. Well, that's what I have right here, I have a sum of two items in the exponent. So that would mean that I'd have the same thing as x to the ln x times e to the c. Now I like to say that this is a lowercase c that I have here and any e to the c would just be a big constant. So I call it the big constant c. And I get e to the ln x. But as we know, this is just absolute value of x. and this is absolute value of y minus two. Should add that there. Now you might not like this, but I can drop the absolute value symbols because this C can take care of positives and negatives for us. Now I could be writing C1 here, I could be writing C2 here, and I could be writing C3, but that can get kind of crazy too, but that's kind of what I'm doing. I've been changing the constants and melding things in. So now y is equal to c3x plus two. This takes care of the negatives. Pluses and minuses, whatever it could be. 
All right, so that is the general solution with the C. Now, notice C is multiplied on now instead of added on, and that will happen quite frequently now. And then for this other part, y, y equals, I have my general solution, so now I just have to plug in 1 comma 1 half to find the C value. So I get 1 half is equal to C3x, which is 1, plus, that would be a 2. Solving this would be C3 is equal to negative 3 halves. And so the particular solution is not just finding C, but rewriting this with C in it. So Y is equal to negative 3 halves X plus 2. That is my particular solution for this differential equation right here through this point. Okay, so exponential growth and decay. You've seen this in pre-calc. We've dealt with it, solved different things with it, and you'll have to use some of those skills here. But where does that come from? Well, mathematical models in which the rate of change of a variable is proportional to the variable itself. So in other words, the growth of population is proportional to a population. This is very common in business and scientific worlds. So here's my rate of change proportional to the population itself or whatever Y is. And we use this a lot with uh, growth and decay, populations, different things. So rate of change of Y with respect to time has a constant port which is equal to a constant proportionality times the amount Y present at time T. So what we want to do is separate the variables and show you what the general solution is to dy dt equals ky. Now we've set you up a little bit because we've used x and y. Now we're going to use y and t or t into y. So when I separate the variables here, I want to bring the dt over here and then I got to bring the y over here. So I divide by y. Now where should I put this k? I'm going to give you a hint. Keep this side as clean as possible. Try to keep constants and everything else over here on this side if you can. So now I'm going to have the antiderivative 1 over y dy is equal to k dt, the antiderivative of that. So this would be ln y is equal to kt plus c. Now, how did we get rid of this ln? Yes, we ln it. So I do e on both sides. So I get y is equal to, and y is just y is because now I have an exponential over here. Exponential should always be positive. It depends upon my c value, though, but we'll see what happens. Now, this thing right here, remember, is the same thing as e to the kt times e to the c. What do we do with e to the little c? Well, we call it big C, e to the kt. There is my sect formula that you used over and over and over again in pre-calculus. And if you didn't like that one, that's the other one that is the same too. Growth and decay. And here it is again. Sect formula, or else you can even use the PERT formula. C is the initial value. Now you gotta be careful with these because sometimes you have extra constants that hang out, they add different things to it. So C, you just gotta watch for it if it has extra stuff. And then K is the constant of proportionality. K greater than zero is for growth, K less than zero is for decay. T is the variable for time, and then Y is the amount of substance at a particular time. Now the question is, is if I know this fact that my rate of change is proportional to my population size, do I have to go through all this to drive these two formulas? No, you do not. It can be assumed, and so then it just turns into a pre-calculus problem. However, like I said, sometimes they'll change up what this y is, and then you'll have extra stuff, and so you will have to do this separation of variables process. So for example, number five, this looks like just a pre-calculus problem. 
What is the rate of growth of a population in a city whose population triples every 100 years? Assume the population growth can be modeled by the basic law of exponential growth, so y equals sect formula. Okay, so then we do know that we're looking for the population tripling, so I want it to be three times what my initial is, which is my c, and I know that that is going to take me 100 years to do that. So with this, I can go ahead and find my k, and find my equation for this. So I'm going to get 3 is equal to e to the k times 100. ln both sides, and so 100k is equal to ln 3. So k is equal to ln 3 divided by 100. There's my constant of proportionality. Punch that into your calculator, and you are going to get approximately 0 0.0110 which is about, and it does ask me for percent, 1.10 percent. Okay? So that was just a pre-calculus problem there. Example 6 also just uses pre-calculus, and so you can use the sec formula or else the half-life formula. I'm going to use the sec formula. This says that we have a half-life uh, 4,000 years. If there's 200 pounds in an inactive mine, how much will still remain in 1,000 years? So first of all, we have to find our constant proportionality. So I know that my half-life is equal to uh, what would be my k times my half-life, which is 4,000. There's my 4,000. So I'm going to go through and solve this. You can probably do this too. So I get k is equal to negative 2, what is that, over 10 thousands. So now to finish this up, it says how much will remain in 1,000 years. So y is equal to 200, because I have 200 pounds starting with it, e to the negative 0.1232 times my time, which is 1,000. You punch that in to your calculator. Make sure you can use your calculator. 168.179, and that would be pounds. All right, we finished up with two problems that were more pre-calculus orientated. However, with these differential equations, you'll see a lot more items come about as you go on more and more with these. And in, like I said, there's a course in college called Differential Equations. That's all you do for a semester. Lots of different techniques. It is fun. All right. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great day. Thanks.